Lawrence, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for inviting me, Matt. You have a beautiful background. Where do we find you today? I'm in uh, at home in uh, Oslo, uh, in Norway. Are you originally Norwegian? Where are you originally from? Uh, I'm originally from uh, Netherlands, as you can maybe hear from my accent as well. Yeah. Um, but I moved here, I think, about uh, nine to ten years ago. I moved to Norway. Yeah. And what's the vibe? You know, it's hot. It's very. I've never been. It's very high on my bucket list. Uh, I'm a skier, so I want to come over and ski. Um, and uh, on the to do, as soon as the world starts reopening again, I'm there. Are you a yeah, skier? Yeah, you're welcome. Are you? Uh, uh, mm -hmm. I'm a skier in the sense, but in Norway, skiing is uh, cross country skiing, yeah. um, and uh, downhill skiing is like everybody can do because you just need to be able to stand, and then you can go downhill. But uh, the real effort is uh, the cross country skiing so yeah. i'm not good at it but i enjoy it that's the the, the thing so See, the, the problem is like you know everyone in my family does it but uh it seems like so much work but that's part of it i guess uh the uh, it's an I exercise like, an exercise getting, in the nature i'm getting better backcountry skiing i want to do the the hot route in uh in europe um at some point one of these days okay hmm. um you are officially one of my favorite authors um and oh, thanks yeah. And um, now the bad news is I, I like to, to read uh, papers in print form rather than on the computer or Kindle. And so um, the environment has suffered uh, at your hands because I uh, print oh, yeah, yeah. your paper. How many how many papers have you written at this point? Do you know? Uh, I think uh, published uh, around 40 to 50, something like that. OK, that, yeah. So and that, but that, that means that I've written many more, but that's the yeah. ones that actually made it. <laughs> right. Uh, well, good. Let's cover all of them today. Um, <laughs> no. But, um, you know, um, you've written some of my favorites, including arguably one of my very favorites of the past uh, few years. Um, so I thought we'd just really just cannonball in right now and start talking about some of them because uh, I, I think they're, they're really fantastic. Um, the first one, which is I talk a lot about uh, and partially because of your work on this, um, that I feel like is not something that the world really talks that much about um, until recently, because they just didn't have either the data or just kind of a way to talk about it, which is the global market portfolio. Mm -hmm. um, so why don't we start there? Tell us what that even means. And then we're going to kind of dig deep and talk about all, all parts of this uh, uh, portfolio. Yeah, I think uh, so. What it means is already uh, it means different things to different people, maybe. But so what I try to do in that uh, the paper that you refer to is um, <clears throat> me and my colleagues often got the question like, what is uh, the market? Because uh, capital asset pricing model, many people refer to it, and often it's S and P five hundred or something. But what is the market? So depending always on. Who you ask, you got maybe slightly different answers because, well, one takes that data series, the other one takes the other data series, include this asset class or not, etc. So then I said to, with uh, my colleagues, let's do it right for once. We spent a month of time on it and then we are, we are done. And how it usually goes with projects that you think will last only a month, they can last up to a couple of years. And that's also how this, uh, this went. But um, well, what we focused on is not the theoretical market portfolio where everything is in, because if everything is in, then it's very difficult to say what is in it. Uh, but we uh, focused on the global invested market portfolio, as we called it, which to us means that we uh, put all financial investors together and see what kind of um, investments they hold that they could trade with each other. So that means if an investor holds a private home, that's not part of our invested market portfolio because that's not something that another investor would easily be able to buy um and there we tr we try to include all these um and every you know and just to say about financial investors so there's also many maybe strategic investors that have hold a position because they have uh, governments for example because they have some other wishes with a certain company that's all what we do not do not include um only those that uh, really we think are financial investors that would trade with each other so, so free floats, you could say to some extent. So tell me what what are the main components, or what what are you can say what are all the all the components, but what what are the main components of this portfolio, and how big is it today here in twenty twenty two ballpark? Yes, 
not to the um, decimal point, but uh, but to the I, I, to the, I just tri- to the it, many uh, trillions. Uh, I updated it last uh, last week. So at the end of because I do it once a year, I update it as a service to the community to uh, just uh, uh, to see where we are. Because I wrote a paper about uh, ten years ago. It, now it's at about one hundred seventy-seven trillion US dollars. So let's call it two hundred. So I'll round up. I'm an optimist. Yeah. All right. We'll do. Yeah. We'll do. Yeah, we'll, yeah. we'll do. We'll do. We'll do two hundred just to make the numbers easy. Um, yeah. What are the What are the big components of that? What What fits into the pie chart? Uh, obviously, a large component is uh, global equities, like listed uh, public equities. That that's the uh, big part uh, of that uh, that pie. Um, other very large parts is uh, government bonds and uh, investment grade uh, corporate bonds. So I think uh, now I have to do it from the top of my head, but uh, I think around forty percent or so is uh, equities, forty-five maybe listed equities, and uh, I think the gov- the bond portfolios are. Probably thirty-five in total, or something like that. So um, you end up with this kind of global market cap portfolio. Um, mm-hmm. You you alluded to this in the beginning, but just to kind of restate it in terms of magnitude, um, what are the big missing pieces? You said it's kind of single-family housing, which is pretty big, right? Like that's I think if I remember in your paper, it's like I don't know what did you say was it fifty trillion, <laughs> hundred trillion. It, it, I think that's very, uh, there's different estimates that are really far apart of this, but I think typically what people say is that about the entire market portfolio, like the same size of it. So in this case, it would be 200 trillion or so would be global, like a private real estate or something that it's about the same size as what is uh, like the investable market portfolio. Uh, so that's a, obviously a, a huge, a huge part. Um, and uh, I think that maybe some innovations going forward that risk sharing on that field is also going to be more possible or more likely, but I think that's a big part that is missing. Um, other part that is um, missing is human capital. Of course, a lot mm. of the capital that we have is uh, is human capital. And so, yeah, that's, I know that there are some people who try to proxy the, uh, the value of human capital, but that's something that we didn't go into. It's it's possible, but it's a huge, huge problem to, to estimate that. Paper, paper, think, number, th- paper number 41. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Um, but I think those two components are probably going to uh, be yeah very important. And I mean, when the I say the private real uh, uh, real estate, I think on that you can also like uh, the the corner shop where it's like a, a self owned corner shop that I, we also don't do because it's not listed equity. So that's those kind of um, shops. I think of course if you add all these together, that's also going to be quite a substantial amount of equity that's uh, that's in that. But so, what is what it but so you include private equity though but that's the, yeah. the the listed but what's your i mean and these questions are so hard to answer so apologies for putting making you do math on the on the spot but mm-hmm. but it's private companies like is that um is that private non-listed is that a huge chunk is it a would it be kind of a minority would you guess or is it like 20 trillion 50 trillion because in some countries it's probably more i would assume yeah, so that's a good. Uh, I haven't. I I think this should be co- coming. If you look at the national statistics offices, they probably have something like where economic activity of these small businesses yeah. is, is from. But I estimate it's it's huge because I think I forgot how much of the total like uh, labor force uh, is by small to medium enterprises. I think it, that's huge. So I estimate that the equity would also be quite uh, substantial if you uh, would, uh, would yeah. add all those up. We talk about farmland too on the show, which is yeah, another one that's, yeah. that's, hard, that's hard to allocate to um, other than, other than uh, but it's changing. Like you mentioned, a lot of these things are changing. We bemoan uh, the real estate sector in the United States is so antiquated, but there's a lot of businesses trying to disrupt that, um, not just on, you know, the, the transaction side and, and servicing, but also the ownership and ways to kind of securitize and share in that anyway. Um, so, all right. So the global market portfolio, uh, roughly 200 trillion, you know, 40, 60, call it stocks, bonds, ballpark. Um, mm-hmm. How much of a bear was that to put, to put the, to get all the data and put it all together? Was that um, a really... I mean, did you just have a sea of interns and P- poor PhD students, or were you doing this, or well, how no, hard no, is no. this? <laughs> Actually, in in some sense, uh, people uh, they talk today these days about uh, data science. Uh, so uh, I call myself, I like to call myself a data scientist in the sense that I'm actually 
digging up a lot of the data myself and evaluating it myself. So it's different maybe than from AI and machine learning data scientist type, but uh, no, I gathered this data all myself. And uh, the main problem was not so much to find the current, uh, what the current market portfolio looks like, because the data for on market caps of asset classes today is, well, uh, there's still things like real estate that is always a debate when I mention it, but uh, there's that it's, um, uh, that can be done, but we uh, decided to go back to 1960 to also make a comparison over time, how the market portfolio had changed over time. And if you go back to 1960, actually before 1985, returns are still available for many asset classes, but to get to market capitalization weights, it uh, was surprisingly difficult. So for uh, corporate bonds, for example, um, it was extremely difficult. So I went to together with the co-author to the, I think they call it the stacks in the library. So that's where normal people can't actually uh, go, but you need a special pass from the librarian to go down in the basement and then dig up uh, books and uh, make with our phones uh, copies of the data and then later type it in with by hand to uh, to collect that data. So, I mean, that's the, the historical part, how we could actually literally collected it, uh, uh, yeah. So huge pain in the butt, um, but a worthwhile uh, venture because it leads you to this paper. And by the way, you mentioned this, but um, listeners, uh, Lawrence has a uh, very generous download that he does from his website. We'll put it on the show note links uh, where mm -hmm. you can download a lot of the not only papers, but data that he talks about um, uh, on mm -hmm. his website. So we'll, we'll put it in the show note links. Um, yeah. So tell us what what this uh, a what this how how has it changed in history? Has it always been sort of forty sixty uh, over the past fifty years? And then we'll start to dig into how it's performed too um, over this uh, time yeah. period because that was yeah. was that the second paper or was that part yeah of the, that was okay. the, that was the second part that we did yeah yeah uh, first uh, we, we, because I think the the sixty forty that you mentioned uh, that uh, that was. Uh, Kind of the we thought it should be quite stable 60 40 that's because everybody talks about 60 40 so that must be it but when we actually did the time series we saw that there were periods that actually it was um i think 75 25 or so for uh for stocks but also periods where uh the amount of stocks i think went to now i'm doing it from the top of my head but to 45 percent or so so there is quite some depending on uh, issuance of course but also on the price of the assets uh, if it's market cap weighted then that's uh, that's a big part of it um so uh, it's not moving extremely fast well if the prices move fast then that also moves fast but also the issuance and the part that is becomes investable because in the end that's also what is important of course when things become if big markets become investable for international investors then the pie also gets bigger on uh, uh, what is part of this global invested market portfolio so that, mm -hmm. um, so it very, it very how it changed quite a bit. Yeah. It floats over time, um, and then talk to me about uh, how's it done. Is this been yeah. a good? I mean, maybe uh, good on, the, on the floats over time part. Maybe I could add something uh, mm -hmm. to that because it's uh, it's tempting to say that uh, there to see to like look a little bit from a distance on the picture and think there must be mean reversion. So prices of this asset class will go up, and prices of that asset class will go down. And it will mean revert to the long run average or so. So we're a bit careful in the interpretation of that because uh, it's that can be part of it. Of course, if some asset class is overvalued, then you would expect it to go out. But there's quite persistent deviations from it. So we also see that um, actually issuance or buybacks in the, sort of, that can also kind of drive it, and that um, um, doesn't always add up to investor returns. If there's a lot of issuance, then investors don't see that as a, as a return. So I think that's a, it can mean revert. Even it can mean revert without investors benefiting from it uh, of predicting it uh, correctly. Yeah. And um, uh, returns. I think that was the, then actually the question uh, uh, that we often got. So well, now now we know what it looks like, but uh, how did it do? And uh, then again, the, over the past ten years, it is relatively easy to find uh, performance metrics for most of these asset classes. But again, when you go back in time. That was uh, quite difficult. Um, and again, for example, um, real estate, to find what the performance of real estate was uh, um, in the 60s. And we talk about global uh, real estate in the, the, the 60s was uh, quite uh, cumbersome. So we did a lot of, uh, um, again, going to the library, browsing online, um, looking for books on this uh, bookfinder.com to, to find everything out. And um, 
uh, in the end, we found that uh, the uh, real return on, uh, I, I don't know whether that's uh, whether real or excess, there's of course different ways to, to look at it, uh, but it's uh, about 4% uh, over this period from 1960 to, I believe we end our sample in 2017 or so, but adding one or two years to such a long sample doesn't really change the average uh, too much. So, so four percent. I mean, uh, nothing, nothing to shake a stick at. Uh, that's pretty good. Although in twenty twenty, well, I would have said this maybe last year after after a lot of the uh, tech stocks and expensive stuff has sold off. Uh, I imagine the expectations are coming down. But there was a lot of surveys floating around last year that people were expecting north of fifteen percent returns on their portfolio. So. Um, so uh, that's not, then they didn't ask me for that, but <laughs> right, right. And also, you know, people, people always struggle with, uh, nominal and real, you know, I think in the surveys, I, that's a, that's so 4% real tack on, I don't know, three, 4% inflation. And you get up to, uh, that sort of seven, eight percent that seemingly every pension fund or institution expects ballpark, um, speaking, yeah. um, okay. Uh, a few other questions we'll just pepper you with um, mm -hmm. one, which would be a guaranteed uh, uh, listener question. When do you guys going to start to in incorporate cryptocurrencies in the global market portfolio? And, uh, and how, uh, how, how, uh, how are you going to think about that in the coming years? Yeah. So that's uh, actually, we incorporate in the, um, one of the drafts of the paper on returns, we actually included cryptocurrencies. But uh, as you know, as academics, we have to sometimes listen to uh, what uh, reviewers uh, say, and they thought it was distracting to put it in. <laughs> so then we actually took it out. And, but now we got uh, so many people that uh, by hand force it in. So I've seen many of the graphs of the market portfolio with that, that somebody added a slice of uh, cryptocurrencies that uh, we're now working on a new paper where we look where the end product should be monthly returns because the previous one that we did on returns was annual returns, which is nice if you want to look at Average, long run averages and these kind of things. But if you want to do really like risk analysis or calculate a beta or something like that, then it's better to have monthly returns. So we're working on that. And now we include uh, also uh, cryptocurrencies. They are, I think, well, it's it differs from day to day, but let's say roughly 1% or so of invested uh, market portfolio. Um, but of course, since the volatility is very high, it's more important than maybe because you can, so it's not a percent of, government bonds or something, it's, uh, it, its volatility is much higher. So it would count for uh, some of the volatility of the market portfolio, even though the weight is only 1%. Mm -hmm. um, so in that sense, um, the question often becomes, uh, is, it, uh, is it an asset? I think, I don't know whether that's underlying also a little bit to your question. I'm, I'm, uh, I don't know whether the word, English word is agnostic for that. So if investors invest in it, then mm -hmm. for me, that's, and uh, it seems that there's many people active in this field and invest in it, and therefore it has some value. So then I think then it has apparently some value to investors. No, so I'm not know, to judge whether they're right in, the, in the, uh, assessing that, uh, attaching that value to it. You know, it's just funny because everyone comes to markets with their own bias and um, people often ask about the crypto angle and the least satisfying response on the planet is when I say, I say, Meb, should I buy crypto or should I include this in my portfolio? And I said, look, if you're struggling with that, just, and this, I actually say, you know, applies to most asset classes. I'm like, just, just allocate in line with the global market weight. So with crypto, I mean, again, again, depending on what it's doing today, mm -hmm. somewhere between one half of 1% to 1%. And no mm -hmm. one wants to hear that, right? They either want to hear zero, I shouldn't own any of this, or they want to hear, I should put half my net worth in this. Um, yeah. And yeah, uh, yeah, it's I like, it's like the least satisfying answer, but, but accurate, I think. And I say, you know, um, that's a good, that's a good heuristic with which to think about all assets. Yeah. You know, should I include gold? Should I include farmland? Say, well, yada, yada. Anyway. Um, I think that's, a, it's, it's, it's a very natural, to me, it's uh, I often say it's a starting point. So if you're not investing in an asset, there can be very there can be many reasons why not to invest in certain assets. But at least you have to. I think it's relevant to know whether you're underweight relative to the average investor in that uh, uh, that is investing to it uh, in it or not. So um, to me, it's very it's a good way to compare your own portfolio against what the average dollar is doing in the world, uh, how they are, are invested, and that can be many reasons to deviate from it. So why doesn't um, considering that it's a, a pretty nice performing portfolio over time, you could have it today in 2022 for 
at least here in the U.S., darn near zero cost, uh, you know, maybe five, 10 basis points. Um, why don't a lot of people or more institutions just buy the market cap portfolio and be done with it? What, what's all this work? Uh, what's all this extra work for? And this may be a lead through uh, into uh, kind of a next part of our conversation on factors. But what's what's wrong with the market portfolio and why, why shouldn't everyone use it? Um, what's... Um... Uh, what's wrong with it? I'm not sure whether I would say there's a lot uh, because it's like it's aggregated what uh, uh, all investors do. So I think it's very difficult for me to say that it's uh, wrong. Um, but of course, um, the well, and I think to get really the market portfolio, I think there are some of these alternative asset classes. You said five to ten. I think then you're covering about eighty percent of the market portfolio because I think if you want to get exposure to private equity or high yields or something, it's probably more difficult to get at that near zero cost, but at least it's, it, can, it doesn't have to be very expensive in, overall for the portfolio level. Uh, that's right. Um, I think what many investors are uh, doing is looking at whether all these assets are priced uh, correctly and um, whether the market is right in, in, in pricing it. And uh, I think there have been um, several studies at least. So, but I got a lot of uh, feedback when I, we did this study on the market portfolio um, that's Apparently, if you publish the market portfolio, then you should also think that markets are efficient and that the cap M works. That is kind of automatically what people attach to that. Uh, uh, but we think of it more as a starting point. And um, I think um, at least I cannot recommend everybody to deviate, right? Because if every, I give the same advice to everybody, then we, everybody should hold a market portfolio. So it's in that sense, it's a very strong. Uh, but given that I'm not convincing everybody anyway about uh, my, with my investment views, I have a... Um, uh, a preference that well in one of the papers that we did uh, with even a longer horizon um, to uh, have a preference for cheap assets and assets with good momentum i think that's uh, for uh, would for me better and then if you look at that at least historically that uh, the performance uh, relative to the risk has been uh, much better than um, if you would simply hold the market portfolio yeah, we often say, look, it's it's a pretty awesome benchmark. I personally think that it's going to beat, you know, like in a Vanguard sort of way, two thirds of, you know, a lot of the portfolios out there. Um, I also personally believe that um, you can improve upon it, um, you know, with, with just moving away from market cap weights, perhaps mm -hmm. within within each asset class. And we do that. We have a strategy that does that. But um, but in general, I think it's a, it's a great starting point. And it's mm -hmm. a great start. I think it's a great starting point um, for a lot of sort of insights and lessons, you know, one of the biggest ones we talk a lot about, uh, and this applies to every country in the world, we talk about it specifically in the US, because we believe the US is expensive right now, but mm -hmm. when it applies, it's e even more so in certain countries like Norway or Canada, Australia, where there's a smaller percentage of the world market cap. Um, the Norwegian uh, um, sovereign fund head was out talking the other day in the Financial Times about um, some of these, some of these ideas, but, but this concept of home bias where, you know, people put all their money in their own, their own stock market. Mm -hmm. And I often say, I'm saying, look, Canadians, you guys, you put all your money in these gold miners and cannabis stocks or whatever. I said, you know, you're only a small sliver of the world. Um, you know, a starting point should be the global market portfolio. Then you want to deviate fine, but this as a starting point mm -hmm. is usually a pretty great place to be anyway, end of yep. rant. <laughs> I think you mentioned the sovereign wealth uh, fund, but in Norway, uh, uh, that one actually, uh, it's of course it has the opposite of a home bias because uh, they're not even allowed to invest in uh, any assets that are dominated in the home currency. So uh, to prevent that from happening, well, they have another fund that is doing only the home biased stuff, but they have separate managers uh, for that. But they only invest outside and also even in the Netherlands. So I think the Netherlands is one of the other countries in the world that has the least home bias uh, of all. So I think the ma many large investors um, uh, from the, the large pension funds in the Netherlands, they have global benchmarks and Netherlands is, what is it? One and a half percent or something of, of their equity portfolio. Global market portfolio, mm -hmm. pretty great portfolio, good benchmark, good starting point. Mm -hmm. um, something else you guys have done a lot of work on and, um, and we talk about sourcing data for the market portfolio as one bear problem challenge you guys took on a whole next level challenge which was uh thinking about factors but think about factors to the 19th century so yes. let's yeah. uh let's let's start to dig in as we move away from the market cap portfolio to mm -hmm. 
factors. Explain to us what a factor is. Talk to us about what a couple of the factors are. And then we can start to talk about this, uh, this concept of factor investing for, uh, for a long time in history. Yeah, so if you think about uh, factor investing, it's, uh, I see it more as a, like a systematic style of investing where you focus on a certain uh, characteristic of, of an asset. And uh, I think the two most famous uh, factors are value and, uh, and momentum, where you look at the value, a uh, valuation um, characteristic of, of an asset and you compare it with the valuation of other assets. And you just, uh, in a very simple way, you could just rank all the assets based on which one on that metric is cheap and which one is expensive. And uh, the uh, typical factor strategy would then uh, take a, a long position in the ones that are uh, cheap and a short position in the ones that are expensive. And well, or that's, that's supposing that you can do a hedge factor. Otherwise you would just, if you are a long only investor you would only buy the cheap assets basically. And you let go of the, of the expensive assets. For momentum, it is uh, focusing on those assets that have performed well. Typically people take the past year or so uh, as, a, as a starting point. So look at which assets have uh, had the highest returns over the past year, sometimes risk corrected, mostly just plain uh, returns. And then you rank them on uh, best return to low return and you buy the ones with uh, the best return and um, you sell the one with uh, the worst return. That's basically how simple it, uh, it, it's, uh, it is. And you can do that on individual uh, stocks or uh, corporate bonds, for example. All these strategies seem to work across uh, asset classes as well. But what we did for the study that you are referring to is look at uh, this from a, um, like asset markets uh, perspective. So we are uh, going to look not at individual stocks going back till the 19th century, uh, but looking at markets. So we treat the US market as one asset and US government bonds as one asset, but also then German uh, bonds and French bonds and uh, uh, like entire stock markets or, or so as, uh, as assets to do this uh, factor strategies with. So um, what'd you find? What's the takeaways? The take, well, what was uh, very surprising to us, because many of these studies on the factors across different markets that I just described, they have been already published in the top uh, finance journals. So um, um, because usually they were like, let's say discovered on US equities first, and then people ventured into emerging uh, other developed markets, emerging markets to see whether this works, but then also across these uh, uh, markets itself. Um, but there's still a lot of people that at least that I talk to that say, yeah, but it could be data mined. How do we know for sure that it's the case? Uh, and um, then we say, well, let's just look at data that hasn't been looked at before, because then you have a real out of sample study if you can do that. So that's what uh, my uh, two co-authors uh, and I, what we did, we just thought about how much data is there before? And uh, then we went back and got all the data uh, back to, uh, well, some instances to 1800. And we found that these sharp ratios that were documented in the, let's say more recent literature, typically somewhere from 1980s or so, that the sharp ratios reported there were uh, roughly 0 0.5 uh, on these factors. And when we went back to 1800s, the sharp ratios were slightly over 0 0.4. So very close to the 0 0.5 that were originally documented. So in that sense, we were, uh, at least I was surprised that it was so similar because of course we know the world was very different in those, uh, those days, but factor investing somehow was pretty close to what, uh, at least the results from that, uh, that, uh, that we saw in more recent periods. So I think that was quite a powerful uh, result that we got out of that. I'm putting Lauren's on the on the hot seat here. Um, what would you say if you had to of all the factors? Do you have any favorites, or do you have ones that you say, you know what? As a researcher, as an investor, I think there's a little more justification, robustness for this. Uh, I know Robico is a big low vol shop, mm -hmm. uh, but mm -hmm. what, but but do you like all of them? Do you are there ones that you say, you know what? I think um, I think these are, or do you think all of them have a have a shot in the future? Yeah, so I don't have, a, uh, maybe that's not the answer you want, but uh, I don't really have a favorite uh, a factor um, because I think, and that's also what we see, that there is uh, uh, a lot of, uh, well, factors don't always work. 
Uh, there's periods that they don't. And uh, that it's good to have the other factors. And just by saying I have one favorite, that implies that I would let go of the others and uh, uh, then have periods that are, yeah, it can be 10 years long that you uh, don't see any return. So I would, I think really our results show that if you have this multi-factor portfolio, that that is way superior to picking one uh, or two of those, uh, of those factors. Yeah. Of course, I think if I think about underpinnings, uh, I what I, uh, like is if there is also not only like strong statistical uh, underpinning, but that there's also a good story that is either, um, like, I don't, can, don't know whether you can say hardwired behavior mm -hmm. or institutional effects that can uh, seem to be uh, good uh, um, ways to explain such anomaly. Yeah. And uh, I think for that, well, at least uh, uh, in the past, uh, what is it, 20 years, something that I'm doing research now, it's always seems that people say, ah, momentum and value, it's easy to arbitrage, it's easy to arbitrage, but when you're in the market, it feels not so easy to arbitrage these uh, these things. So even though you know that these, uh, well, at least I believe that these factors uh, are there on the long run, it doesn't come for free. And there are periods, well, I think we both suffered, uh, at least from value for a little bit of uh, a time before uh, uh, last year. Yeah. So you have to be quite strong to, uh, live through underperformances of one individual factor. Um, yeah. I mean, that, look, that applies to both factors. So, you know, you mentioned yeah. value has its time in the sun or momentum or Laval, yada, yada. Um, but also asset classes, you know, people struggle with this just as much where the U.S. outperforms foreign or commodities are underperforming. And I, I like it, like it, it really hard for many investors. And this isn't just, you know, I, I often, people assume that institutions are somehow, um, you know, uh, exempt from this, but we see a lot of these big institutions time after time, you know, make similar mistakes as individuals where, um, I, you know, I they chase returns yeah. and, you know, on and on. I had several presentations in, I think, what was it, uh, early 2009 for clients where the hypothesis on the table was the equity premium is zero. Hmm. And uh, that was kind of, and we, uh, together with a colleague, we had to kind of say, well, no, we think the equity premium is positive. That's just the beginning of 2009. And of course, uh, three months later, the market just went up for, uh, uh, no, I think it hasn't really come down until the last two months. But I think that's how easy it is to look at 10 year past returns and then just say, well, now, because in that time, of course, if you looked 10 year back, uh, the performance actually was uh, close to zero. And uh, yeah, then it, yeah. many were con contemplating to just get rid of their entire equity portfolio. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's rinse, repeat, man. It happens every cycle, mm -hmm. you know, over and over yeah. and you see the flows and you shake your head and you say, how could people be doing this again? And it happens over and over. Um, what, what do you think about in general, you know, um, one of the things you mentioned was, you know, a hundred, 200 years of this data, but then, you know, as the factors become known, um, do you think it's a scenario where they will continue to outperform in the future because of what we just discussed, which is people, you know, the flows chasing things and people being human? Uh, do you think the the outperformance will be less because of arbitrage sort of concepts? What's your general like guess as to what the what the future holds for you know? Because in my opinion, I think anything but market cap weighting should have a percent or two um, tailwind just because of that. There's no price, uh, there's no mm -hmm. value sort of link. You know, things can go just bananas as we saw, you know, last year or two in the US. Um, mm -hmm. But what's your take? Like, how, how yeah. do you, how, how should investors think about factor uh, investing? And, and do you like, there's, there's certain quant shops out there that think um, it's possible to tilt or time when some of these look better versus their own history. So a lot of people are saying value looks great now. It's, you know, um, at an extreme spread. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, uh, so I, well, now you ask several questions at the same time. Um, I know, I know. Sorry. <laughs> so, um, I, I think the, um, for uh, past return, so I always think that uh, um, many of the returns documented, well, you've seen many backtests in your, in your life as well. Huh? So to actually, um, 
make money in real life on that. Typically, I would not assume that in sample or even though you try to correct as good as you can for um, data mining or for data dredging kind of issues, it's, it's, it seems to be like a, a prudent uh, assumption to make that out of sample, you would get slightly less than what you found in your in sample uh, results. But I think given if you look at uh, many of these, like our study finds a sharp ratio of 0 0.2, four or so over this long uh, period, which is not like, it's not one or one and a half that you sometimes see documented. So then I would get a bit skeptical, but I think 0 0.4, maybe it's a little bit on the high side, but I don't think that's uh, like uh, exceptional. And I think something like that would uh, be possible also uh, going forward. Um, and the reason indeed is not that we don't know about it. Although I'm also a bit skeptical that people in the past didn't know, there's also several of these old writings where people are, kind of hinting to value at momentum already 150 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was, of course, now it's much easier uh, accessible and implementable, all these uh, things. But to actually follow that course and keep doing it, even though it hasn't worked for three or, or four years, I think that is something that um, um, I think they will, uh, these, especially value momentum, they will keep existing for for that reason and of course it can be if suddenly everybody becomes rational and switches off that uh, fear and greed uh, kind of mode it could disappear i'm not excluding that possibility but given what i've seen over the past 20 years i would find it surprising if suddenly that uh, switch goes around and uh, suddenly everybody starts to uh, be more rational in in, in that sense um, yeah I feel like that's that seems like unlikely the, to happen. <laughs> that's the one thing we can count on is human irrationality, no matter what happens. Yeah, and, um, and what you said, I think, is also important. It's it's because I think that's often said. Uh, it's um, it must be the retail investor, and I'm I'm happy to say that they might be more irrational. But it's not only people who are pushing the buttons at uh, institutions. They're also people, and they also have their career risk and all kinds of uh, um, incentives to maybe actually follow the same patterns as um, uh, as we see in the data that we call factors, yeah. I mean, that, that's a perfect segue into a pretty uh, timely and impactful, significant institutional topic. And there's two of them, uh, and we can kind of pick and choose which way you want to go here. Mm -hmm. But these topics of A, uh, sustainable investing, ESG mm -hmm. topic, and within that, is a, is a little subset of uh, what we call sin stocks or sin companies mm -hmm. um, because uh, these are hot topics is, is a big marketing concept, you know, in many cases um, for asset raising on these firms. It's something perhaps many uh, use to distinguish, you know, kind of their product versus others, but let, let's dig into the actual data of um, kind of what you found in some of your research here. Yeah, so I think we are haven't. Uh, so I, I think it's intriguing question. So uh, um, because there's a lot being said and a lot being done, and I don't know whether it's always for the right or the wrong reasons. So uh, together with some uh, some colleagues, we uh, said so. If let's just ask ourselves these questions and and see what we can find. Sometimes in the data, or sometimes on arguments and uh, prior literature. So. Um, um, I think, I don't know where I should really, I think one of the things when you talk about these uh, SIN stocks is uh, I think often the question comes up is, uh, do they get uh, extra returns or not? I think that's okay. something that often is at least what uh, people have uh, on their mind. So um, I think excluding stocks and doesn't have to be SIN stocks, but once you start excluding, if you exclude a few stocks of your, of the global market portfolio, probably you're still going to be quite well diversified. But when, if you start excluding more and more, then of course, suddenly you're losing diversification. So I think that's one of the, the things that in one of the papers that we studied, we just quantify also, well, if you're less diversified, that is a cost because you could be more diversified and then you could invest more in equities, for example, because now like you increase the risk of your portfolio, but you, uh, you could have diversified it better and then decrease the risk of the total portfolio. So there is a cost to it. If you exclude a little, maybe not so big, but if you exclude more, then that's going to hurt you. Um, but also, it also depends, of course, what you like, what's the expected return of the, the stuff that you exclude. And many of the SIN stocks, they actually have what we would call favorable factor exposures. So they tend to be the stocks that are value-like, quality-like. Um, and 
therefore they have a higher expected return than the market has. So if you exclude them, then your portfolio has slightly lower a return than the market. Uh, you could repair that because you, there may be other value stocks or quality stocks that you could buy instead of those stocks, those sin stocks that you don't want to have in the portfolio. So you can repair it to a certain extent, but if you just do it blindly and naively, just exclude those stocks, you would get also a little performance drag uh, out of that. And then I think the, the, the third question, which I think is uh, uh, most difficult to empirically assess is, is there a sin premium on, on top of this? On top of, and that is a very difficult question. I think that we did a lot of uh, uh, research and literature search, and it's not easy to kind of um, get that part out uh, to, to uh, disentangle it from all the other effects that we see because returns are so noisy. And uh, uh, what is considered sin is can also be time varying uh, on top of that. So it's not that uh, 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 that easy, but um, that could be on, on top of it. There could still be a sin premium, but I think the uh, primary stance was that what was called a sin premium until a couple of years ago, my, my colleague found that this actually for a large part was quality exposure. That's well, that was only the Fama French three factor model at that time. So, but if you have this now, we have the five factor model, we could actually kind of explain why this uh, additional performance of, um, of sin stocks was there. Yeah, and I mean, uh, I, I think, I think, it, you know, part of this is, is challenging um, from the sense. You mentioned a couple great points. One is um, perception changes over time, of course. Uh, two, uh, I remember looking back at the French Fama industries, you know, back to the twenties, and I think mm -hmm. two of the top three or five performing industries all time were tobacco and beer, right? So, mm -hmm. um, you know, what what do people love? And you can have your own opinion if those are sin companies or not. But uh, but a lot of people, the tobacco in general. Um, sets them off for for various reasons but you know you had some insights in particular about uh ehg which applied to tobacco companies and um kind of who owns tobacco yeah. companies and and the divesting yeah. you want to talk a little bit about yeah. that because i thought i think it's fascinating and it's not the message you have is often i, I don't think the um what the assumption of the majority of the media thinks about mm -hmm. this topic Okay, so maybe I, because I also know that you have, I don't already have vested interest, but at least I know where you're from. So you're, uh, uh, mm -hmm. I think if I heard correctly from the previous uh, uh, talks that you did with other people that you have a, a background around the tobacco industry, but. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, also... look, I, I've, I've never been a smoker. When I was a kid, I used to hide my parents' cigarettes. Like I, I saw one of those ads from the eighties where, you know, it was like, you know, smoking is going to give you black lungs or something. And so I used to literally like hide my parents' cigarettes and like everyone of our parents' generation, you know, they, they, they everyone smoked, but, um, you know, I grew up in North Carolina, partially in Colorado also, but, but in North Carolina certainly was exposed to the tobacco industry. Um, but, uh, but other than that, have no real, you know. Okay. You know, no, connection. no. But I mean, that was the background yeah. that I heard that you you sure. were talking about with some other guests. Yeah, so yeah. I can also take. I am uh, in some sense I, I'm, uh, from different area, but I was also hiding the cigarettes from my parents. <laughs> uh, but uh, um, at Noahville, and uh, yeah, yeah. my dad also passed away on uh, lung cancer, uh, yeah. ten, uh, maybe fifteen years ago now. Yeah. So I yeah. mean, it's. Uh, but I think the for me, so that that's my personal uh, story. Mm -hmm. My mom is uh, still smoking uh, a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but so I, th I don't want to recommend anybody to smoke. That's, sure. uh, that's what I, so I right. would recommend people to stop smoking. That's the first thing I want to say, but I also don't Europe, think Europe's much better about this where on the cigarette, you know, packages, they have like giant skull and crossbones, basically like, they're like, if you smoke this, you're going to die, right? Like the it, package. Uh, it's, it's, it's written on it yeah. uh, that you're going to die uh, yeah. from it. And it has a picture. If you don't uh, read it properly, then you see uh, like a black lung or yeah. uh, different uh, uh, things, uh, uh, pictured on it yeah but um so i mean but so then the question becomes if a person who is smoking because that's when one of the papers we ask like is is this exclusion effective so if you every day pack uh, pick up the the pack while your kids are trying to hide it for you you see it's it's it kills it has a picture of somebody who already died on it and you still decide to smoke is a pension fund that is going to exclude this uh, from their investment portfolio going to be the tipping point to stop have that person stop smoking. I'm, it could be, but I'm 
not easily convinced about that uh, that argument. So I think that's if that's the the goal of um, like excluding tobacco stocks in this case, but it could be other sense stocks. Then I don't think that's really going to uh, uh, to drive it. Right. But I can so I think if it's a moral issue, so. I, for my mother, I when I stop by at the airport, um, I, I come from Norway, so I can buy uh, tax-free cigarettes. But I don't because I think it's bad. She should stop. So I'm not kind of. I don't want to be involved in this uh, activity. So I don't do it, although I know it would be financially advantageous to do it. So if that's the reason that investors don't want to be associated with it, well, I cannot say much. If you don't want, then that's a preference that you you clearly have. That's at least different than thinking that the world is becoming a better place uh, because of it. And I think one of the main special things why uh, well, tobacco also is an easy uh, target because like it's bad and there's not really alternative uses that are so great. So it's it's easy to fit in this uh, 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 since start. But tobacco companies, they most of the trading, I think one of the main points that I uh, that we want to make always is the primary market and the secondary market. And uh, tobacco companies have issued shares long, long time ago. And they explain, don't explain, explain, of, explain uh, primary and secondary for. Those okay, who so are, if uh, uh, some if some companies want to set up a new business, they need money. So they uh, one way to um, get money is to ask investors, please give me money. And that's uh, what I call a primary or like an, an issue. You go to the stock market to get uh, 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 new money. But once that money, but you have you have sold your new shares to the market, and the market has absorbed them, and. Uh, at that point, the market is selling it to other people based on preferences and whatever. That's that's what's what's happening. But the company is not involved anymore because they already got their money when they sold the shares, and they can set up whatever they want to do. And uh, they, so the effect that you have by uh, selling them, maybe you will like depress the stock price. If too, enough people are selling a stock, the stock price will, compared to other stocks that are not in, will go down. But if you don't have to go to the market to sell new shares, you're not really that, yeah, that affected by this uh, uh, by the stock price. Maybe, uh, and I think to, for tobacco companies specifically, they tend to have quite some cash because they have addicted customers, so they can't really go anywhere. Uh, and um, they um, actually they're buying back shares. At least many of them are buying back shares. So now they're buying back shares a little bit cheaper than they were otherwise doing. So for them, I don't think that this whole, there are industries, I think mining, I hear often that there's more, more capital intense and they might actually need to go to the market to get new capital uh, uh, regularly when they open a new mine and so on. So maybe there, that's, this effect is, uh, or the potential effect uh, that you have as an investor is bigger, but you have to really look at it case by case because if the company that you're trying to exclude doesn't need any fresh capital, maybe not that effective to, uh, to do it. Um, so that's one of the things that we, um, yeah, we looked at uh, extensively. And uh, I think we had another, so we also looked at more in general, if you, because often we look think about the price as investors, yeah? so the return or the, the price of, uh, of capital, but also the, we looked once at the quantity of capital. Now, not specifically for uh, tobacco companies, but just in general for, um, uh, we also did one study actually specifically for tobacco companies, but also in general, like how many um, did more capital flow to good companies, like, I don't know, green companies or uh, what's the opposite of uh, sinful, virtuous companies or so, um, than to, uh, to sin companies. And actually, it looks like if you add this all up, that the quantity is about the same that goes to green or brown or sinful or not sinful companies. So... Yeah, maybe if sustainable investing, so the, the conclusion is it hasn't happened. So if that is what the world wants to invest more in better companies that have better ratings or are greener, then the world is not there yet because there is some way to go. The past 10 years, nothing much was effective there. I was, uh, I was joking on Twitter, kind of getting into it. I said, you know, for a lot of people who um, really are, you know, championing, uh, being champions of the cause as like you know the the probably better scenario is to actually be shareholders and then vote and you know people that's like you know explodes their brain i said you know you really want to make some impact uh you know uh, that that is a potential way yeah. to do it and you're starting to see some activist campaigns in this sort of genre that you wouldn't normally see yeah i think that's the <clears throat> but it's a bit um difficult in the sense that 
of course, you need to have uh, many to vote on behalf of many shares to have some impact on these companies. So then you need to kind of collaborate uh, with other investors that have the same view. And um, it also takes effort to actually uh, write up new proposals to kind of uh, get, dig into it. So I think some uh, investors are more keen on saying, well, the tobacco, for example, uh, the tobacco company is uh, less likely to switch to some to become a good company. So I'll put my effort in something else than to spend time on them or so. But I don't think that, uh, uh, yeah. So if you find 51% uh, of investors, you could, I think, uh, who agree with you that uh, they should put, I don't know, less nicotine or uh, I don't know, but do things that are in the end are better for the world. Let's put it that way. Uh, then you could influence the company by definition, but you need to gather enough uh, uh, shareholders to agree with you that this is the way to, to go. Um, well, then there's also all kinds of political issues, whether this is something that we should want, but that's, uh, yeah, that, that can be a political uh, issue, but you can for sure exert efforts. I think even what is often uh, missed here is that uh, because once you, um, once the share is issued, often that's it, you can vote, yeah? so you should and, and talk, but bonds, they mature. Stocks don't mature, but bonds mature. So every so, uh, if the assuming that many of these sin companies also want to keep their capital structure kind of uh, uh, the same, they need to roll the bonds every I don't know five years, ten years, depending on the the maturity that they have. So if you want companies to change and you're a corporate bond investor, you could all the time at least say, well, you change this incrementally, uh, this better. Otherwise, when you have to roll your next bond, I'm not going to to buy it. At least that's a fresh capital moment when new fresh capital is uh, can be directed to the company or to another company that behaves better. So I think also for bondholders, that is a bit uh, underutilized maybe, that they have also some impact on uh, uh, le letting their voice be heard to the company management to, uh, uh, to do well. And I think yeah. that's uh, something we will see. Yeah. Um, well, let's, uh, we're going to free verse here for a little bit. Um, oh, actually, I got there's one more thing I wanted to ask you guys. Mm -hmm. Robico put out a monster 120 something page uh, expected returns PDF uh, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, and had a, had a big climate angle. Um, as you think about a framework for con kind of constructing return expectations, mm -hmm. um, talk to us a little bit about how you think about that. You know, is mean reversion play a role? Is it um, climate is something we should be thinking about? How, how, how do you kind of think about the future being different from the past and what are the main levers most investors should consider? Yeah, yeah. So that's what we, what I've been doing over the past, uh, I think this was our, the last one was the 11th publication or so. So every year we update it and we have a kind of a five-year horizon on when we think about it. So not too long, but also not too near term. Um, what we do, we have uh, a study on really, um, what you call like equilibrium risk premia or something. So on the really long run, where we use this two two hundred years of data, if we have it for certain asset classes, and we try to use uh, economic theories to get like a long run picture, uh, unconditional or like a really uh, long run picture. But then uh, we know that uh, the uh, we believe that the market is not always in equilibrium and have exactly those risk premia that we have seen on the long run. So. Um, we our second uh, building block is uh, valuations at the asset class level now. Eh? So we look at whether equities are expensive, uh, bonds are expensive, uh, corporate bonds are expensive, these kind of uh, things. Um, and that's a very important component because uh, I think we know that we can say that long-term interest rates on the long run should be 4%, but if they're currently 0%, then the yield we get is closer to zero uh, than to the 4% that we think we get in the really, really long run. So valuation is, is important. And then we have a component that is also uh, trying to look at is, the, is there a reason for this valuation? So a macro component where we, our macro uh, economists look at is this is it cheap for a reason, so to say, or expensive for a reason. Try to put this uh, valuation into perspective and see whether that is uh, like it's overly expensive or overly cheap given the macroeconomic uh, outlook that we, uh, that we have. So that is the that is the main component that we had for ten years, and last year we also introduced a climate component, um, and that is more related. Well, then we look also again at the asset class level, and not at whether within the energy sector there's winners and losers or something, because that's another uh, level. But at the asset class level, which asset classes 
maybe more um, affected by climate change than other asset classes. And um, the first thing we actually uh, went back to look at is to think, well, how can climate change uh, uh, returns? Because it's not maybe that obvious. So I teach also a class at, uh, uh, at Erasmus University in the Netherlands on finance one, so the basic principle. So I thought, well, if I teach that to the students, I will also put my basic formula of um, uh, pricing uh, in, in, the, in this report <clears throat> and look at um, what part of climate will affect the cash flows that we need to discount and what part will uh, affect the discount rate. And because in the end, it's cash flows that we need to discount that will determine the price of, of an asset and then the return of, of an asset. Because I hear a lot of uh, stranded assets. I'm not sure whether that's also a term that you hear a lot in the in US, but stranded assets, that's typically something that uh, I hear a lot. To me, that sounds really like something that would be a cash flow effect, because that means that there's less cash flows than originally were predicted before we knew it were stranded assets or something. That reduces, well, once we realize that those are assets are stranded and kind of there's a whole market looking at, they know what oil reserves are and et cetera, et cetera. So no, do you know better than the market what is stranded or not? That's the important mm -hmm. question, I think, for an active manager uh, then. But once that is known and you have to like, take that out of the, um, um, the numerator, then the expected return is again the same because the discount rate hasn't really changed. So from that point on, the expected return is, uh, is the same as for other assets. The other thing is if you think it's more risky, these uh, carbon intense assets, you have to discount them at a higher rate. That's also a possibility. But then you have to also realize if you do that, then the expected returns on brown assets is higher than on green assets. Hmm. So there's consequences to kind of thinking about this way on, on what, what this means for investors. <coughs> so we are putting this uh, in this piece together. And I think what we, um, how we see it now is that the discount rate probably is going to increase for the, the, and that's the current discount rate and the one that we think that will be there in equilibrium or so if it's properly priced. And we think that the discount rate can go up further for um, um, carbon intense uh, companies, which means that um, in the way that the path that it goes up, that is not good for brown companies uh, uh, on average, right? Because then you start discounting to, against the higher rates, which means that the price is going down. So I think that's what, um, uh, what we think that carbon intense assets uh, will uh, do a bit worse than um, like green assets or how you say non-carbon intense assets, mm -hmm. which would be a negative for emerging markets and high yields because they tend to be a little bit more carbon intense than uh, developed market equities and investment grade uh, corporates. And of course, the big thing that is in between here is of also, let's say, oil price, because it can be carbon intense, but if oil price is going up, as we have seen in the past, then those assets through the cash flow effect will do very well, because now the cash flows that are streaming into these companies. So that's still, uh, of course, also an effect that uh, is there. But we try to at least try to put a little bit of more structure on the discussion, because I, we hear a lot of discussion about it on where these expected returns are coming from and how this will evolve over time. Um, that's what we try to, uh, to do uh, in, that, uh, in that report that you are referring to. So what, what are the big returns, baby? What, tell me what asset class is going to do 20% a year for the next five years and what's doing oh, negative yeah. 10, yeah. right? You got, you, what, uh, what, any, uh, um, anything in general looks better than historical and what looks worse than historical for the next five years? Um, so then historical, since the, the starting point is actually quite low, eh? so because of the risk-free rate is quite low, um, the starting point is so low that there's actually not a lot that is looking better on the nominal terms than uh, historically was the case. Um, our expectations for commodities are quite okay because we think that, um, um, I think there are, no, I don't know it's top of my heart whether it's exactly on the long run equilibrium, but at, if it's not, then it's at least very close to it. Because also in the energy transition that we see, a lot of commodities are needed to build, build all those windmills uh, to the electrification that we see and the car fleet, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of uh, mining and, uh, and, uh, and other industrial metals that are necessary for that to happen. So we think that um, commodities have, and commodities have also been lagging a bit if you don't take the last year into account, but like the 10 years before, uh, commodities have been lagging a little bit on, uh, I don't know, uh, prices, um, 
but also on investments from that side. So that there's not hasn't been a lot of investment in new mines or new uh, activity. So we think that um, commodities are closest to the long run average. So like uh, have a quite high return. I think for equities we are close to is it five five percent or so in in dollar terms. I'm not sure whether that is making you enthusiastic. I've heard you say. You expect zero percent for the next ten years or so, so maybe that it's very optimistic to come up with five. But uh... well, but to me that that's just U.S. You know, foreign okay. I think is is very attractive in particular emerging markets. You know, but but I think commodities. You know, I'm sitting here, and I I tweeted the other day where I said in Los Angeles um, we had uh, I said I spotted six dollars uh, per gallon gas um, in, in LA last weekend, which is really high. Um, but as commodities are kind of ripping here and, and across the board with the exception, of course, of probably precious metals, um, you know, it, it, it reminds me of the full cycle, you know, 2000, early two thousands, uh, commodities kind of were institutionalized really for one of the first times ever, broadly speaking, partially because they had great performance. And then, every institution and their mother started adding commodities. And then what happened, commodities had horrible performance for a decade. You started seeing all the institutions, um, or many of them, not all of them, uh, many of them start to divest and say, okay, well, that was a mistake. We don't think commodities are a great investment, uh, just in time for commodities to have, you know, a, a nice run here again. We'll see how long it lasts. But, mm -hmm. uh, but, but I think, um, we poll people regularly uh, just to kind of get a feeling and, and almost no one has any meaningful allocation to real assets in general, uh, other than their own house. So REITs, commodities, tips, um, uh, that that area is, is mm -hmm. often very under allocated, it seems like. Well, yeah, okay. And yeah, that's, uh, I think especially for, that's the other thing, I, maybe, maybe that goes even back to my PhD thesis that uh, I think I wrote back in, early 2000s, where I was also a chapter on commodity investing, where I think if you want to protect your assets against inflation, well, one of the uh, sources of inflation is commodity prices. So if you're investing in that, then at least there is a partial protection coming from that uh, part that you can at least protect some of your assets against inflation. So uh, that's, that's at least an attractive um, uh, property of uh, commodity investing. Apart from that, Currently, we expect it to also have a high return, but it, uh, it correlates nicely with uh, purchasing power. So, uh, yeah. 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 Um, how do you handle, I mean, circling back to the very beginning of the conversation, how do you handle commodities as part of the global market portfolio? It's that's notoriously a little squishy to, you know, <laughs> to, to weight commodities. Is it based on production or, you know, economic use? How'd you kind of slot them in? Yeah, so in the in that uh, the one that I annually update, there mm -hmm. we had to the reviewer uh, demanded us to kick it out, which was quite uh, I don't know uh, special because that was also in in one of the first drafts we we made estimates to put it in, but then in the later version when we uh, looked at the returns, so part two of that uh, project, then we put it uh, back in ourselves, but uh, then we looked again at financial investments and we think uh, how we reasoned is that like uh, tankers of oil that is not really financial investments so basically it's derivatives that you can see as financial investment but derivatives have the um uh, that somebody is long the other one is short so zero that is uh, net so what we did is we looked at uh, uh, gold that is held for investment and uh, silver and uh, what is it uh, uh, I think there's a few more uh, palladium or so there's I think a few uh, platinum and palladium I think so that's the four uh, uh, metals and then we looked at estimates of investors that hold commodity linked investment products so that are kind of long commodities on uh, on that side but th that's compared to gold and silver that was not a very big part of that portfolio so I don't know uh, from the top of my head what total share was but uh, we included it in the the last uh, draft so it's in the and now we're going to add cryptocurrencies to that same basket of commodities, kind of. Uh, although, of course, it's not a physical commodity, um, but mainly it's gold. And I think that's uh, I think it's fair because many investors do hold gold in as part of their uh, portfolio, uh, like a long only gold investment. So um, I think that makes sense to have it uh, uh, into that. Yeah, and for derivatives, it's just uh, yeah, a bit complicated, and we don't want to put oil tankers in. 
as we look out to the horizon 2022, uh, what's on your brain these days? What else are you thinking about? What's interesting to you? What's got you confused? What's got you excited? What's got you depressed? All those emotions. Uh, uh, what, what's, uh, what, what are you, you working on? You mentioned in the beginning uh, real estate. So mm -hmm. I was, because there's so much going on in the crypto that uh, I thought I also have to think a little bit more about it. But uh, what's actually, um, what I was thinking about is that you now see that um, real assets are being tokenized, not in, at extremely large scale now, but uh, uh, there is tokenization of uh, residential real estate uh, going on in the uh, uh, US uh, specifically. Um, and uh, the nice thing about it is that when it's on the blockchain, it's public. So I was digging up myself uh, again, looking at uh, the what is it, block scout or whatever to, uh, to look up that data. So I have a working paper just out on uh, whether how investors that invest in tokenized real estate, what their portfolios look like and whether houses worth $50,000, whether they are really kind of um, lead to fractional ownership. Because I think that's the promise of this decentralized finance that now you can own a few bricks of a house. And um, it seems that that actually is the case. Mm -hmm. So I was surprised that this market, uh, um, at least in the initial study that I did and, and, and put out, that the market is um, be living up to the promises. Uh, so I expect more on, on that side. I'm um, now also thinking about the project uh, because now also stocks are tokenized, so you can trade them actually 24-7, mm -hmm. um, the, the tokens of these, of these stocks and uh, individual stocks, that is. And um, I recently heard that uh, many of the stock return is uh, earned during the night rather than during the day. Now we can uh, also look at uh, if we have the tokens that trade 24-7, we can actually look what part of the night these returns are made and is it based mm. on information or what's what's going on what uh, to uh, to make or maybe it's just the opening that is uh, that that is causing it that could also be the case of course uh, but yeah. i'm i'm trying to look a little bit on this um uh, the tokenized uh, sphere that that's one area i think is uh, uh, promising more than for me the like the nfts and so is not that interesting i'm more into the the real assets that that uh, can also be um on the blockchain um, and of course, we already talked about sustainable investing. I think that's something that is on my agenda, um, a big part of my research agenda as well. So I'm thinking more now these days about impact investing also. So how can you, uh, not ex excluding, but how can you have real world impact uh, with your investment portfolio? And uh, I think that's very exciting to, to think about, but I don't what's, have any answers yet. Just I was going to uh, say, what's the preview there? I don't know. What, uh, what, what, are you, what are you marinating about? What are you thinking about there? Uh, when I think about, uh, uh, for example, when I think about governments, then let's, uh, if you think about it in a, uh, uh, let's say, ESG perspective, huh, then uh, typically the countries that come up that are very high on this ranking is, for example, Norway, the country I live in. But mm -hmm. I don't think we are the ones that need the money the most in the world to actually make the world better. I think there are governments that need the money uh, more to actually change part of the world for the real better. So, uh, so I think this current uh, ESG frameworks, they are good to think about uh, who will pay me back, who is responsible with my money. But I don't think that is where you have the biggest impact for the every dollar that you invest. So I'm more thinking about which, how can we characterize countries where there is a big gap when you think about sustainable development goals or something like where there's big potential to make progress and where it is likely that uh, the money doesn't end up in the wrong pockets, but that you actually will have some uh, positive influence on these, uh, on these countries. So that's what I'm now trying to get my head around, how to, uh, to think about that and how to structure that um, in an investment portfolio. Yeah. So I think that's, that's exciting to, to think about. Not, yeah, not only who, um, uh, who will give the money back, but who needs the money to do something good. That is kind of the idea behind, uh, behind it, yeah. Um, what's been your most memorable investment you've been involved with? Anything good, bad in between? You remember, uh, of course, so, the yeah, you're talking your lifetime, yeah. I think you're, uh, the thing is, uh, you talk to many uh, CIOs on the, on the, on the podcast, mm -hmm. but now you're talking to a researcher. So mm -hmm. I'm actually not a PM or a, a, choosing a lot of investment. So uh, one that I think is most memorable to myself is when I was, um, I think, probably, uh, what is it, uh, nine years old, something like that, maybe 10. 
that's uh, that was on the news. That's the, uh, the the U.S. dollar versus at that time we had guilders in the Netherlands, so it's pre uh, mm -hmm. pre Euro time. Mm -hmm. That it fell with I forgot fifty percent or something. There was a big drop. Maybe it was uh, eighty six or something like that. And then uh, I went uh, with my uh, I pulled two guilders out of my uh, piggy. Uh, what is it called piggy bank? I think you call it. Huh? Mm -hmm. I went to the local uh, branch of the of the bank and I bought uh, one dollar. And at that time, everything was without commissions or anything. So I just went there to buy one dollar because I thought the dollar was uh, a value investment uh, for myself. And I was very proud coming back home to actually uh, 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 show everybody that I was now into currency uh, uh, currency management. And uh, of course, I think the dollar at this day is still about at the same level as it was when I bought it then. But I found it very uh, uh, fun. And I, I came to realize that this is also something that kind of uh, how this uh, financial markets work. That From that moment already, I was sparked by my interest in financial markets, how it works and what determines the value of certain assets and so on. So that's yeah. what's uh, always stuck with me. You know, yeah. I mean, it's it's a great lesson. Like thinking about currencies uh, for many people tends to be a, a challenging concept when you start to think about investments. But from a practical standpoint, we used to give away, you can find them on eBay, a lot of the um, hyperinflated currencies from Zimbabwe mm. and other places, you can buy them and, and pick them up. And it's a fun reminder uh, of how certain currency systems work, et cetera. Yeah. Um, Lawrence, uh, this has been a whirlwind tour from uh, the global market portfolio to your piggy bank to ESG to factors and everything in between. Um, we'll, we'll definitely have to do this again sometime. But in the meantime, where do people go? Uh, we'll add the show note links, but best places to keep track of what you're up to, your writings, what's going on? What's, uh, what's the best spots? I think the best spot um, is to look at the homepage from uh, me at Erasmus University. That's where all when I have a new working paper, I post it, uh, I post it there. But most of the working papers in the end end up at SSRN. So if people are uh, happy to look at SSRN, that's uh, that's where they will see it uh, past as well, coming past as well. So I think that's the best spot to uh, to look at it for uh, for research from my side. And you're uh, you're also fun to follow on Twitter. So listeners will post your uh, your Twitter handle as well. Ah, uh, yeah, of course. There, I also promote other people's work that I think is interesting to uh, to have a look at because it's more than just the research that I do myself uh, there. Yeah. yeah. Lawrence, it's been a blast. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for the invitation. Thanks.